Das schwarze Auge. The black, the black eye. Wait, isn't it the dark eye? Well, yes, it is. But technically, it should be the black eye. But seriously, which sounds cooler, the black eye or the dark eye? Well, it's dark eye by far. So I'm going to be taking on a journey into one of the biggest role-playing games to emerge from Europe. And if you are looking for an alternative to your TTRPGs, this might be the one. Hello, and welcome to our next TTRPG exploration series, The Dark Eye. My name is Guy, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to this remarkable role-playing game. Designed, developed, and created in Germany, this is the first RPG that we're looking at in depth on this channel to have come from mainland Europe. Does that mean anything specifically? Do we care that it's from Europe or America or Honolulu? I mean, who knows? No, specifically, specifically, we don't care. Or do we? Maybe we should. Watch until the end of the video to find out. But first, sponsor time. This video has been paid for by Ulysses International, makers of the game. I have been contracted to produce four videos on the RPG subject, but more specifically, I have been given carte blanche in terms of these reviews. I can give good, I can give bad, I am free to let you know what I feel. Now, there is more on how you can get a massive discount when you go to The Dark Eye via a link at the end of this video. When you ask someone from Germany or Austria about the dark eye, the general reaction I've gotten is an instant glint in the eye, a subtle smile, and then I am told the most defining characteristic of the game, the world of Aventuria. It's a living, evolving, aging world unlike anything we've seen from other game manufacturers. Basically, as the world ticks over. As our real world years tick over, so do the years in Aventuria. An NPC you might have met when you were playing as a 10 year old school kid is now a hero or an injured soldier or has died, say 20 years later, because the game time follows our time. The game world updates yearly and contributors of officially sanctioned material grow and change and adjust the world. It's really dynamic and it's a living space. And it's instantly the reason why I would avoid this game. Now, anyone who's watched this channel knows that I dislike, with great intensity, pre-made worlds. When Dungeons & Dragons said, hey, run a game in our new world, or in Avernus, or in wherever, I went, yeah, sure, and then I rewrote it, redesigned it, reimagined it, I even had new maps made. So, when people tell me, or when I tell them anyway, that if I play the Dark Eye, it's going to be in my world, and they tell me, it is impossible, you can't, the world is the system, I go, okay, I see, so it's either your way or the highway. Hmm. Now, Torg did the same thing. Torg, the game mechanics, were there to support the world setting. But the world setting was interesting enough, but also generic enough, that I could overcome my loathing for pre-generated worlds and I could play in it. And it was a lot of fun. Is the Dark Eye like this too? Is Aventuria so amazing that I'd abandon my prejudices and play in their world? Wait until the end of the video to find out. For now though, let us focus on what makes this game unique, aside from the living world, um, which, I mean, if you get into the living world, I admit, if you get into it, it would be awesome to have your world moving and changing and adjusting. Uh, but that's not the point. That's what we're talking about. Right. So, okay. What is the Dark Eye? Firstly, it's a medieval fantasy game. There are dragons, ghouls, magic. There's demons. There's gods. I mean, all the wonderful things that you expect from a fantasy game. And I'll, I'll, I'll go more into the lore of the world, into Aventuria, in the next video, if you like. Comment down below. So, let's see, from a rules perspective, the game makes use of 1d20, 3d20, 1d6, 1d3, and 1d2. Now, there are basic modifiers that are applied, you can get plus one or minus three and, and, and that sort of thing, 
All characters have attributes and skills, and you roll on a d20 or on multiple d20s if you, you, you to roll to make a check. And if you roll under or equal to the value listed on your attribute, you succeed. Modifiers can be applied to the dice roll or to the attribute, depending on the check. Combat's a little bit more complicated, and uh, we'll get into that a bit later on. Numbers are rounded mathematically up or down, depending on the value. 6.5 becomes 7, 6.4 becomes uh, 6, for example. Finally, when it comes to all things dice, on a roll of a 1 on a d20, a potential critical occurs. You have to make a second roll, and if you succeed in that second roll on beating the check, in other words, you have to roll under again, if you succeed, you have a critical success. Very, very powerful. If you roll a 20, and uh, that's a failure, a potential failure, you then roll again, and if you fail again, you have then botched, as the game calls it, or you have a critical failure. Now, if you roll a 1 and then you fail your confirmation, it still counts as a normal success, but it's it's just a success. And of course, if you roll a 20 and then don't fail the confirmation, so in other words, you actually pass on the second check, it just counts as a regular failure, not a critical one. Seems straightforward, and I do like that. It makes a lot more sense when you read it as well. So the attributes, again, however, are where we start to see what's coming up in terms of complexity. So these are the basic eight attributes. Courage, the measure of your bravery, determination, and level of um, stupid hero, basically. It also covers your faith, your resistance to magic, your effects, your belief in yourself, all those kinds of wonderful things. Sagacity, your general knowledge, um, logic capability, memory, knowing what sagacity means. Intuition, your hero's hunches, gut instincts, empathy, and sort of stress response. Charisma, personal magnetism, charm, and persuasiveness. Dexterity, uh, as one might expect, this is nimbleness, hand-eye coordination, uh, ranged attacks, that, that, that kind of thing. Agility, this is your reaction speed, your body's flexibility, your reflexes, and that kind of thing. Now, I do find it interesting that this is a differential that they bring in. So you, you have dexterity and you have agility. So we'll learn later on in the next couple of videos about the implications of that, which I actually think are pretty awesome. Uh, then you have constitution, effectively your character's stamina, life points, resistance to poisons, diseases, that sort of thing. And then you have strength, raw muscle power and how to use that uh, strength as well. So I like the fact that there are certain familiar attributes and abilities that we, 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 we know, have come to know and love, but the other two that are added, well, we don't have those in, in, in other TTRPGs. I mean, courage, I think, is a lot of fun. We used to have morale way back when in, in Dungeons & Dragons, but I think courage is a lot of fun, and if it's used correctly, then, then I mean, those, those are brilliant. Anyway, so, so those are your attributes. Now, to make an attribute test, the player rolls 1d20 and needs to score either equal to or below the attribute score. So it's straightforward. Now, when a check is made, the GM can apply a modifier, of course, and the modifier is applied directly to the attribute not to the die roll. So when facing a dragon, the GM might decide that the dragon's massive size imposes a minus five penalty to all heroes. When making a courage check, all the heroes, their courage value is lowered by five for the purposes of not running away in fear and screaming like a little screamy thing. So it's interesting that it's applied to the tribute, not the dice. Um, as a scale of how the attributes measure up, for example, anything below 8 is considered really bad, not likely to succeed, 12 to 13 is acceptable, and 18 or higher is considered masterly, but your, your, I mean, your chances of failing are very small, but it's not 10%, because you'll see those attributes do something much more interesting when you start to make skill checks. Hold on to your hats, folks. This is where um, it gets interesting. So uh, this is a skill check like you've never seen before. At least I haven't anyway. But um, OK, uh, some of you might have, but I mean, it was new for me anyway. So every skill is linked to three attributes. Now, as we've seen, I mean, this this is not new. We've seen that before. Uh, sometimes the GM determines the attributes. Sometimes the rules determine the attributes. And sometimes the players determine the attributes. Uh, you know, they're, they're allowed to offer up options and that sort of thing. 
Now we've, we've seen that, we've seen that. Modifius has done that, for example. So let's say um, tracking. Tracking is a skill. It's linked in the book to courage. You need to believe in your gut instinct as to where to go. Um, and having followed game on foot myself personally, I can say that you need to believe in yourself. You need to have faith in your ability uh, to, to, tr to track stuff. Uh, you need intu intuition. Well, yes, obviously intuition, it makes sense. Um, and then agility to be able to move around the tracks or to look under things and, and to, to move lightly so as not to disturb the path that you're following. So now when you are making a tracking skill check, you roll um, a check per attribute, per attribute. So you need to roll under your courage or equal to to succeed. Then you need to roll under your intuition or equal to to succeed. And then you need to roll equal to or under your agility. Fail one and you fail the lot. So that's why having an 18 in an attribute is only a near guarantee of success for that attribute. Uh, for skills, if you have min-maxed, you'll find you're only as strong as your weakest attribute. The rules suggest having three different colored d20s, so when making a skill check, you roll all three at the same time. The one color is linked to the first roll, the first attribute, the second attribute, and the third attribute. They even have a color wheel to say, well, we suggest these colors for the different attributes. Uh, and I mean, it, it, it makes sense. And let's be honest, most people have got a couple d20s lying around. But hang on, hang on, hang on. Can you have skill points? Can you improve your skill? Or can your, can your skill that is improved improve your chances of success? Well, yes. Kinda. So going back to our tracking check, if you have a tracking skill of seven, this becomes your skill check pool. With each attribute check, you can spend points from your skill pool to lower your die result. Let's say you need a 13 uh, to succeed at courage and you roll a 15. You can spend two points from your pool to lower that die from 15 to 13. There is no point in spending more skill pool points. As a matter of fact, you want your skill pool, <laughs> you want your skill pool to remain as high as as, as possible. So the next check you make is uh, intuition, and that is, let's say, you've got to get an 18, uh, or you roll an 18, and your intuition is only 15. So now you've got to spend three points from your remaining five. Uh, that leaves you with only two skill points left, right, in your pool. However. The next roll, which is um, whatever it was, you roll a four, which is way under your agility, agility score of 14. Now you don't get points back, sadly. You, you don't get points back. You, you just don't need to spend any points. This means you've successfully completed the skill check because you have passed all three, but you have two skill points remaining in your pool. The more of these you have, the better your success. If you have zero points left, or like one or two. It's just a basic success. You track the target. If you had four or five points left, you track the target, but also learn that it's carrying a heavy load on its left shoulder. On say having 14 points left over, you might learn that it's also wearing a red cloak made in a far off realm, uh, recently had an argument with its partner and is in a bad mood. So, your skill pool, by the way, those points refresh the moment you succeed or fail your check. So if you make a tracking check in the morning and you use up all of your pool points, when you make a tracking check later, your pool is back and refreshed and renewed and you can use those points to spend as you so need to modify your dice. Skill modifiers is also a thing. So if you have, let's say, a minus two to your skill check, let's say it was it's raining as you're trying to track the target and the rain is hiding the tracks, you get a minus two penalty. All your attributes are reduced by two for the purposes of the check. Conversely, if you get a plus two, because let's say it was raining and the tracks are now in nice mud, which show them up quite nicely, then all your attributes have plus two. If your attribute ever drops below zero, by the, or below one, I should say, by the way, you simply can't succeed. You can't even try it. It's like, it's just impossible. It's, it's impossible. Critical successes on skills are particularly spectacular, as are critical failures. They're particularly difficult to get, though, too, though. In order to get a critical success on a skill check, you need to roll a one on two different attribute checks, and then you get what is called a double one or a critical success. Now, you don't have to roll to confirm the criticals. with a, it's, it's just a straight up, I rolled a one, woohoo! 
If you roll all ones, so you get three ones, then you get a critical, critical success. The best possible outcome. If you roll three twenties, then you get a spectacularly bad, the worst possible outcome imaginable. You kill someone by accident. So, now what I like to do is that they include the chances of you actually getting all of these. Now to get two ones or two twenties is approximately one in 140 rolls. To get trip ones or trip twenties is one in 8,000. And I personally can't remember a player ever rolling three twenties in a row. Anyway. Okay, leveling up uh, uses adventure points, which you earn as you play through the game, obviously. And um, you get them also in character creation as well to spend to, to build your character, but we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, I do like the idea of how the adventure points are spent. It's very, very complicated. I can go through that, but um, I think it reflects it quite well. So there you are. Uh, competitive checks. Uh, these are checks made against active targets. So you both roll a relevant skill check. Let's say you are trying to hide and someone is trying to spot you. It's perception versus stealth. You both roll 3d20 and the amount of success, in other words, the amount of skill pool points left after making their various checks is the winner. Target wins in a tie, the passive wins in a tie. So the person being snuck up on, the person being snuck up on wins, the sneak loses. You have cumulative checks and combined group checks, which function in a fairly straightforward manner. I'm not going to go too much into that. So that is, that skills and attributes, which is really cool. And they, they're dynamic and, and, and they change, which, which I think keeps things fresh. So you have derived characteristics from those attributes and skills, such as your life points, magic, uh, magic points, your attack and defense and, and so on. You have fake points. These are useful to uh, do all kinds of things. You can act first, you can steal initiative, uh, you can ignore certain effects, um, improve your defense, uh, you can improve the quality of your skill check, uh, or you could re-roll a failed roll, or you can even re-roll damage by spending a fake point. Now you get these back for doing great deeds, for finishing an adventure and, 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 and the like. There are conditions that your character can suffer from. Dozens and dozens and dozens of conditions. So many conditions from blindness to invisibility, from muteness to rapture. Each has its own effect and its own, own, own kind of implications for the character. And there's a comprehensive list of all of them in the book. You sometimes get benefits from them, by the way. Character creation. Okay, so this is where it's it's very very interesting. It's way too complex to go into in one in one video in this video. So I will do that again. Let us down no down below. So, fifteen steps to character creation. Only three of them don't actually have a consequence on the character's abilities or stats or derived stats. So. It's a point by system, as I said, adventure points. Um, you get to choose special abilities. You get to choose advantages, disadvantages, which give you more points. Uh, you can allocate your attributes, your skills and the like, and then you calculate your derived values. That's the, that's the, the, the sum of it. Now, there are some fun mechanics represented in different level of experience a character starts with. So you might want to play a squire, a young plucky squire, and someone else might want to play an experienced knight. There's rules for how to actually do that in terms of keeping them not equal, but keeping them on par. So I, I, th that's, that's fantastic. Character backstory is right in the book. There's a whole bunch of questions that they give you to answer to build character backstory. I love that. Um, there's species that we would expect. Humans, elves, dwarves, half elves. Wonderful. Culture is there. There are dozens of cultures. Now, of course, these are based on the world of Aventuria. But having read through them, in my opinion, they're fairly straightforward enough that you could fit them into your own world setting by changing a few names. It's simple. So the cultures have a big impact on what skill your character has access to at the beginning. So it's important to choose wisely. And um, yeah, they've got all the lore, of course, that you would expect. The, the cultures, norms, naming conventions. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Nearly 200 pages of the book are dedicated to character creation, by the way. I mean, that's that's pretty good going, if you ask me. That's just under half the book. Combat. Okay, combat is what one might expect. You have initiative, that determines who acts first. Then when you attack, you roll a d20, and you have to score equal to or under your attack skill that you're using. 
Your target then gets to make a dodge or parry check, again, depending on what attack is being made. Critical is interesting, as uh, they halve your opponent's defense and double your damage. Criticals are really critical. If you succeed on your attack and your target has failed on their defense, well, then your hit goes through and deals damage. Now, I like to think about combat in this manner. It's 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 much more dynamic. I roll to hit because I'm a good swordsman. You roll to defend because you're a good swordsman. And and so we get this kind of thing going on. Critical fails or botches, as, we, as we've called them uh, in the book, cause more damage to you if you fail. Or there's another result. You throw your weapon away or it breaks or you fall over and present an easy target. That sort of thing. Um, damage is usually 1d6 plus modifiers. Armor deducts from the final result before whatever, you know, so, so whatever's left over is the damage that goes through to, to your character's life points. Uh, when, ro when rolling defense for each attack, you kind of go, well, hang on a minute. You're rolling a defense for each attack coming in. So if you're attacked by five people, your defense is always going to be high. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, the Dark Eye does not do that. Um, for each attack, uh, or for each defense roll the character makes after the first one, they start to suffer penalties for each subsequent defense or, or block that they're trying to do. So in other words, as they block more, they have less chance of succeeding. Now, I do like that. I really, really like that. So very robust rules. And there's more to combat, but that's the basic idea. Magic and Divine Magic require the caster to use energy points, arcane points, or karma points um, for Divine Magic uh, to cast these spells. Now, they spend the points, and obviously the bigger the spell, the more points it costs. Once the energy is spent, though, the character then makes a skill check, rolling 3d20 and trying to release the spell. Each spell is linked to different attributes and, and, and so on. And the usual skill pool modifications exist, so you can try and adjust and, and make sure that that, that, that that happens. So that's got to succeed, and then the spell goes off. And it's about that point that you then go, okay, that's it. I mean, I, I, I've, I've, I've read everything. And then you hit the chapter called Detailed Rules, which is even more, which is wonderful. And I'm not going to go into those because they are detailed rules. So remember when I said that this book is from Europe and does that have an impact? It does. So there are 394 pages roughly in this book. And it is clearly presented. It is the rules are very straightforward. Every rule has an example. And where they could have used a simplified explanation, they don't. They use a robust and they will repeat that explanation until it sinks into your head or my head anyway. They even include a checklist for all of the optional house rules or rules that optional rules from the book that you might not actually be using or that you might be using. You have the checklist, you give it to your players. It's like, this is what we're using. So I was completely impressed with the thoroughness of this book. Except for the bestiary ent ent entry. So it's barely 10 pages and it contains more rules than monsters. And so you will need to pick up their bestiary. That's that's a given. Um, but that's not a shocker. Many, many, many rule books require you to have the bestiary as a secondary secondary book. So it's not it's not it's not surprise wise. Um, production. The book comes in hardcover or in uh, softcover, which I have here, and it fits budget. It fits budget. And there's a significant price difference uh, between the soft cover and the hard cover. Soft cover is cheaper than you think. Having gone through the rules, I I I can say that that setting idea of Aventuria, which put me off the dark eye initially, I don't think you need it. I don't think you don't kill me. Don't kill me. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. But I think that you could tweak the names of the cultures. You could have your own world map. You could have your own world. And I don't think you're going to have to change too much of it. I, I get the idea that a living, breathing, dynamic world could be a huge draw. I mean, it would be amazing. Star Trek was like that. We kind of got new information. It was super cool. But you kind of had to be on that journey for 30 years to really appreciate it or to kind of get into it and just absorb it all. So my personal opinion... You don't need it. You don't need Aventuria if you don't want it. The game is very reminiscent of second edition Dungeons and Dragons, which has its focus on, I would say, more realistic simulations of mechanics. It also feels, though, like Pathfinder 1, uh, the original Pathfinder, where there's a huge amount of character customization. 
positives, all positives. Now I compare it to those two titans of the game because I think this is one that deserves to be up there with them. It's clearly a huge success in Europe, and I mean, why not? Beautiful books, spectacular setting, robust and clearly well-tested rules. It's everything that you want from a TTRPG. Now, I am super excited to play this with my group. Um, I, I, I'm going to be very interested to see what they think and, 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 and their approach to that, because it's always different from a player perspective, right? So, okay, so now I'm going to hand it over to you. What's next? Do we do lore? Uh, do you want me to explore Aventuria, talk about the world a little bit more? Is it character creation? Is it just a playthrough like we did last time with Torg? Let us know in the comments down below and I'll make it happen for you. Now, have you played The Dark Eye or Das Schwarze Auge? Have you played that? What are your thoughts? Are you getting ready to stab me in the face for what I have said in today's video? Or do you agree with what I've said? Share your experience with us down below. Uh, we would really, really like to hear from you. This video was sponsored by Ulysses International, a division of Ulysses Spiel. The link uh, down below will take you to their product page where you'll score a discount, basically because you watched this video and then you clicked on our link uh, if you want to purchase any of the books. And there are, there are dozens of books covering the Dark Eye, as one might expect. 30 years of publication is bound to lead to a couple books at the very least. Anyway, um, yeah, more on this next week. Let us know what you want. Until then, however, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.